I was 16, I was 90 pounds. <clears throat> and, uh, and the guys talked me into going to skating so I could get some exercise, you know. So I, I went. And I couldn't skate at all. But there's a young lady who was there, she was eight years my senior, and she took me under her wing. And she taught me everything about skating. And uh, we really actually, after about a couple of months, we went out on the floor <coughs> and we did a waltz. And we won first prize <laughs> in the thing. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting a little hoarse, and uh, I, uh, I uh, stayed there, and every time we went home at night, we stopped in the ice cream parlor and started eating ice cream, but I didn't realize I was gaining weight, so after two years, when I hit my 18th birthday, I went down for my physical, thinking I was going to be a 4F, and my aunts all came to the house, they thought I was going to be a 4F too. But when I got down there, <clears throat> I passed my physical. And uh, when I got home, I asked them what they were doing. They said, they wanted to make you feel good to be in a 4F. I said, well, I didn't say nothing. I just took the paper out and laid it on the table and it said it accepted. <clears throat> and they all started crying. I was wondering what they were crying for. What the? That was it on my. So I ended up going to Camp Landing, Florida, for my physical. I mean, my basic training, and uh, I was in the anti tank division in there. I learned how to shoot the the seventy eight the cannons, I guess you would call. Them. But the <coughs> that was. After we, we finished basic training, we had five guys in there in our second division. It caused a lot of trouble for the sergeants. <clears throat> for some reason, they shipped them, the first platoon and the second, third platoon out, and they ended up on Okinawa, on the great battles. But when I we went, <clears throat> they shipped us out, and we got a ship, and they took us uh, well, out in the Pacific, and we were going zigzagging and everything like they had to do. And when we got down to, got to Okinawa, the war was over. So, and they ended up, we had, <clears throat> we had to stay on the boat for another two days to find out where they're going to ship us. So they put us in the uh, ordnance. All right. All right. Okay, so the they, they put us in the ordnance, and uh, we were all transferred in, in the ordnance. So I got a requisition job to take care of that. And uh, I was uh, doing pretty good at it, but uh, I decided I was getting lonely after I did my eight hours in there. I went back to the barracks, so I decided to volunteer to run the, the movies and take care of the, the library, and uh, that, was, that was it. And I I took all of that. I was drafted. I didn't want to go in the army, but I was drafted, and I went. And what I wasn't, branch were you? I wasn't sorry. <laughs> what branch did you want to go in? Uh, I actually uh, never thought of it myself uh, where I wanted to go in, but uh, they they appointed us, and I was put in ordinance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was put in requisition, so I was trained to do that. So I done that for a couple months. And then the other, the one who was te teaching me, he ended up going home. So they put me in his place. 
but uh, had, that's what I, I do. I had a, a corporal on one side of me and a PFC on the other side of me. We had three deaths uh, with everything in the ordinance mm -hmm. in there. And you had to have a requisition to get anything from the army <laughs> to get this. So I had one story it was about a general. He came in. He was real nice. He, he was very jolly. But as soon as he walked in, my left leg started to shake like mad. And, uh, and I tried to talk to him. You know, I asked him what he wanted. He said he had a problem. I said, what's your problem? And he says, I don't have a requisition. I said, well, sir, when they gave me this job, they said, if a five-star general come in here and didn't have a requisition, he does not get it. So I'm sorry, sir, you, you don't, cannot, I cannot give it to you. He said, oh, I, so I'd try anyhow. He was real nice. I, uh, I never thought he was actually checking out if I could want to give him a given the objects, you know, he wanted. But uh, he said, I'll be back. And I, I thought that was, I wasn't going to see him no more. Well, about two hours later, around that time, he came in. But he came in with the, the general of the army. So they say he was. And there, my commanding officer and everything like they all, all came out, three or four of them. And they said, hey, I got the requisition. He put it on my desk and everything. I said, well, sir, we'll, we'll take care of it for you. And when I looked up, I saw the general of the army. I don't know his name, but he, he went like this. Gave me a, and I looked at him. And he, so I just, well, I just said, okay, here, they said I did the right thing, not giving him the record without a requisition. So mm -hmm. I, I never saw him after that or nothing like that, but. Where was this at? On Okinawa. All right. Uh, uh, I, you don't remember the name of the general? I don't know. The only five star I, then was. No, he's he was only he's only, he was only a two star. Okay. He was only a two star. All right. And uh, still was, very interesting. But uh, I thought that he was very jolly. But the, they said they, he might have been in there to check to see if I was giving her anything away without requisition. So I found out. I did the right thing. He came back with the requisition and he uh, thanked me and took off. And I didn't see who picked it up the next day, but they said somebody from his worries that picked it up. And that was it. And I uh, never had no problem with it. But uh, I don't know, that's, we all had a good time. Uh, Working, I had five Japanese prisoners, and they were, they were uh, very good. But there's only one time I had a bad time with them. They it was 115 in the shade, and uh, when we got to the section, the people they had jitneys to put the trays on the truck. You know, what they order, they didn't have no. Jitney. So he asked me, he said, Hancho, he says, it's too hot, they don't want to do it. Because their third jitney was broke down. So I went to the next section and tried to borrow a jitney. I went to actually three section and I couldn't get it. So I decided that, I said, you have to do it. I need the stuff for tomorrow morning. He said, okay, he, and I'm starting, I'm talking to the sergeant of the section, and uh, all of a sudden I heard tapping on my shoulder. 
to the honcho. He said, they don't, don't want to work. I said, well, they have to work if they like it or not. And we had to get that back to the office. So I got so mad, I didn't have my 45 all the way. I left it in the office. And I said, I went over to the sergeant and I said, no, can I borrow your pistol for a minute? Yeah, he gave it to me. So I clocked it and backed it for it. And they all start laughing because they knew I was always kidding off, you know. And, and I said, I'm going to shoot the next person. Don't do it, but I won. So I shot it in the dirt. And I could have got hell, I guess, but uh, I, they reloaded that truck real fast. And they had no trouble. And the next day I told them, well, I was going back to the section, I said, I'm a little peed off that you did that and you wouldn't do it right away. And they were making no kinds of excuses. So the next day when I went to pick them up, the, they were all happy to run them towards and I told them to stop. I want five new people. <laughs> and they got all excited. So I took the five people all on the, by my truck. I circled around the compound and I told them to get off. And I said, the other guys jumped on. And from that day on, I never had no trouble with them. <laughs> and uh, so it was nice. They were very good to me. And uh, in fact, at the end of the, when I was getting discharged, uh, sent home, he gave me uh, the ashtray that he made. The, the interpreter. He picked up all these shells and everything like that and he sat in the corner when they weren't doing no work and made this ashtray. It was a nice ashtray and everything. And the other, each one of them made me something to take home. It was nice. So they were, they, they told me they didn't care for the war and everything like that. They were drafted like I was. And that was it. But the, they they went home about the same time I did. But the one one guy he didn't have no no I, his place was bombed out with that uh, atomic bomb. And uh, but the, I le I later found out that he did find his his family was still alive, so he made it made it back all right. Mm -hmm. That's it. All right. Uh, now, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's, that's, that's all right. It. So, this story, all of the stories you have told so far, took place before the war ended, correct? Uh, the war was ended. It right. Was ended. It had ended, and I've been. Uh, I was transferred from the, the infantry to ordnance, and, that, and, that's, and that's how I got the five uh, guys to work with me. You know, the, they were with me at all times, okay. and they were. I had no problem with them. That was the only time I had problem with them was when the heat was hot and the and the jitney was uh, broke down. That's all. But besides that, I really. Okay, so um, when you had heard the war ended, uh, how did you and your fellow soldiers react? Oh, and we're how very did you happy to celebrate. Well, when we found out, we had to stay there on the ship another uh, two weeks. They wanted to appoint us to, uh, to ship us to another department. So that's how I got in the ordinance. They, we all got put in an ordinance. So the guys who were with me all went in, in the ordinance, but they all got different sections to take care of. And I had the ordinance, uh, requisition to take care of. So I, that's where I got my rating too from that. That's about it. Now, were you present for the uh 
Were you on another ship or were you present for the actual ceremony when the Japanese surrendered or no. do you remember where you were when that was happening? I was on the ship. We didn't even know it was over until we got there. They said the war was over mm -hmm. and now we got a place here someplace and we sat on the ship for two weeks I think it was and oh, uh, do, you, they, do you remember the name of the ship by chance Ty typhoon US typhoon US I think I think it was US uh, just I know it was typhoon yeah. TYPH oh yeah, just yeah. like the storm yeah all right we'll look that up all right now by chance while you were on the typhoon uh, did you happen to see any battleships, any carriers, and do you well, have any description? All I saw was two whales to go. Two whales? Okay. <laughs> Sitting out there, we, it was on Sunday morning, we were all saying a rosary. And uh, we stopped to look at the two whales. Mm -hmm. and that's uh, something we never saw, like, until uh, so we all got a kick out of that. Uh, but that was it. I didn't see no... Uh, Anything else? All the we were carrying on like mad on the ship, so we didn't. I never. We never saw no other ships going past us or anything like that. Okay. Now, actually, we were down the hull. I was on the the top bunk <laughs> on the thing. Okay. Now, after the war, did you spend any time in Japan? No. Okay, so you were not part of the post-war no. occupied force. I, uh, they, well, we were all drafted, so they just send us all home. And, all right. uh, and I, I went back to uh, to. Uh, it was in uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. we, we came in, in in the port in Seattle. We actually the, the port we went out. We came back, and I remember we short cheated all the beds. <laughs> I remember that, mm -hmm. and that was a a joke that the, we did all. The, they did it on us, and we did it on them. So that was it. Okay, and um, what was the reception like when you got home? When you got back to Seattle, uh, what was the reception like? Uh, from the from well, the people. When I got down to Third Street Station in Philly, mm -hmm. I was coming out the door and I was in my uniform, and they gave me a cab. I took a cab home and uh, went from uh, Third Street Station down to Fishtown, and uh, it was late at night and. Uh, around nine o'clock or something like that and uh, my father and my mother were so little and a couple of my brothers but the, they were very glad to see me and uh, they were glad to see me home that was it and that's, that's, I don't know I can't say nothing about that <laughs> they were all glad to see me uh, so uh, that's it then I went to bed. <laughs> I'm sorry? And then I went to bed. <laughs> okay. Um, did you attend any parades, any celebrations after you got home? No, there were no, uh, nothing big. No? no? Nothing. I, uh, I joined the American Legion, mm -hmm. but they put me somewhere out west, I don't know why, but anyhow, I stayed and I've been and I got transferred back to Philadelphia and I've been in it for about 72 years in the American Asian. So I still get uh, the news and everything. Alright. Um, now did you do any reserve time um, after you got back or were you just on no, a discharge immediately? I, I was going to be a, a, I wanted to be a sign painter. But uh, when I uh, went around looking, there were so many sign painters that were selling appliances that I didn't want to be a salesman. So I went and I worked for the American Cane Company. 
and I was going to stay there for about a year and then go out again and look. But I never went out because I stayed there for 42 years, the only job I had, and uh, that was it. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there and I became a quality control inspector in there. And that, that was it. All right. And now uh, that was your career? Career. Navy career, uh, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> post-Army career uh -huh. was uh, was doing what, I'm sorry? Uh, I was in requisition. Okay. Uh, in the ordinance, mm -hmm. in the, the Army. All right. Um, so tell us a little more about uh, your life after you got out of the Army. When you got back home, uh, tell us about your career, your family, when you retired, um, things like that. Uh, a lot of things happened. I know it. When I came home, uh, I guess. Huh? Yeah. Um, when did you get married? How many kids? Just tell us oh, about was, your general oh, life after you got out of the army. Oh, after I got out of the army, I worked in. Uh, I worked in uh, American Can. Mm -hmm. uh, I was 20 years old when I went in there. I said, and I got, I, I worked like I was 30 years old when I got married. Uh huh. And uh, we went. I met Marie, and she lived in West Philly on Pelican Street. But the and the Transfiguration Parish, we got married in Transfiguration. And then I had three girls, two boys, and there's two of them sitting right here. And then I have two sons, and they were six, five, and the other one was six, three, I think. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I was a small one. <laughs> well, by the time I hit 90, I dropped two inches. So I went from five feet. <laughs> All right. So, um, looking back, what influence on your life did Army service have for you? How did it uh, help you throughout your life, that experience? Well, when I took over uh, the, when the job when I was doing requisition, when I, after eight hours I come home, I wasn't, wasn't doing nothing. So just, I, I wasn't a ball player or anything like that, so I decided to volunteer to, to run the movies and take care of the, uh, the library. So the library camera was in the library, so that's why I took the library too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, just uh, took it over there. Now uh, this is a drill, this is a drill. Ammunition trans. Okay. All right, so after you got out of the arm, uh, army, you had a choice. Uh, could you describe that? Oh, well, my brother Charlie was saying, <clears throat> John, you could go through two doors. One, you could keep your stripes, or you can uh, go in the other door and forget about it all together. So I, I said, uh, I'm going to go out. I'm not going to join up. He said, you'll lose your stripes. I said, hey, I don't care about my stripes. I just want to get out of the Army. and. Uh, and that's what he said. He 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 signed up. <clears throat> so when the other thing came along, they dressed them. So I had I said goodbye, John. Chaw. When I didn't go, I was out of the army, and I, I didn't have to do nothing. So and that was it. So your brother ended up serving in the, both World War II in Europe and Korea. And Korea, yeah. Okay. Um, did he make home, make it home okay after Korea? He uh, he came out after that. He didn't sign no more papers after that. And uh, 
when they said the war was going to end the world wars and everything, but it didn't, didn't end the whole war. So mm -hmm. that was it. And so Teller went back in and uh, I stayed home. Yeah. Did you, uh, were you able to keep in touch with him through letters to make sure he was okay? Oh, maybe once in a while. We, we didn't do that much uh, writing because uh, he spent most of the time, he went all through Germany and all, all, the, all the things because he went, but he was building up bridges and everything like that. He was very good at that stuff. So, mm -hmm. so he ended up five years in the first war and the other one, I think it was two, two and a half or something like that. I don't know. I don't know how many years he stayed there after that. But okay. that means I would have been in there with him if I had signed up with him. If I didn't sign any. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and we will just ask one more question. Uh, but before I do, are there any other stories from your time in the service that you remember now that you'd like to go over? Anything else? I can't remember anything. I, 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 there's so much. There were so many things that happened. But the, I used to, oh, I was, <clears throat> um, um, what about movies? You said oh, you, you worked with I, movies? Uh, see, the Army at the time gave movies every other day. So I made the deal with the Navy. We'll change film back and forth, you know. So we'll have a movie every day and a double feature on a Saturday and Sunday. So they all liked that because they they got to see the movies. And we had the the captain our outfit. They were up on a hill. And, and they just had to run down to get a seat. And the officer didn't uh, mean nothing. To, when it came to the movies, they, if you get a seat, you got a seat. Actually, the seats were made out of bomb crates. They were going to stand this high. And uh, they all, that's what was, that was the first movie I had. And then when I was transferred to the other company, they, uh, put me in charge of the movie again. I, I actually volunteered again for it. So mm -hmm. I made sure they had a movie every day. And they, I saw it going my way about seven times. <laughs> but the, 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 that was it. Okay. And I used to play music for them. And then I got to a point. When it rained, I used to I had to shut the thing down without a big open window for my camera. And uh, so it wouldn't rain. When it, when it rained, I used to shut the big screen down, and I would shut the door, and I would keep the, the show going. I had about seven or eight guys on top of me to see the end of the show. And I let them do it, and that was it. Leave them to see the end of the show. And well, I did things like that for them. They liked it. All right. Um, now, while you were in the service, uh, you received. No? No. Now, um, there was a, there's an old uh, adage in the military called the Dear John letter, where uh, a, a oh, service yeah. member will get a letter from home that says uh, from a girlfriend that uh, we're, oh, we're yeah. broken up. Uh, did you help your fellow soldiers through any of those? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you tell us about that. They, uh, well, well, I had an officer. He actually used to watch them. They used to come here at nighttime, you know, in, in the library, and they would let everything out. Sometimes Brian or everything like that, but they would tell him. So no, if he told his buddy, 
they would tease him and everything like that. So one day, they looked, the lieutenant wasn't there, and I was in there for getting ready to run the show. And the guy says, where's the lieutenant at? I said, he's not around. He said, he won't be back for another couple of hours. He said, I had a problem I wanted to, can I ask you? Well, sure. <laughs> so I let him tell me, because uh, I didn't know him, his name or anything. So he told me everything. He let it all out and he cried and everything. I let him cry. And then and he thanked me for it because he had it off his chest, you know, and uh, he liked it. And so I used to do it every once in a while. Somebody had a problem. I listened to him, that was it. Mm -hmm. and so they didn't have to tell the buddy because the buddy would actually tease him and everything like that. So I just listened to it and that's it. That's the way it was. And I used to tell them I had to play music before the show and after the show while they're going home. And then I would tell them, don't forget to write to your mother or something like that. And, and they like that. And, and, the, and the mother would write to me, ask me sometimes, uh, what's my son doing and how is he doing and all that stuff and everything like that. So I had to talk them to the right to the mothers and everything like that, and they did. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was it. So I, I did a little bit of everything. <laughs> so I was happy with it. it, it, it uh, they were all nice. I never had no problem with them. That was it. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of stories, but I can't tell the story. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's okay. Yeah. So the last question I'd like to ask you, um, this will be seen for generations to come. Uh, historians, researchers, education, uh, someday they might use, watch this video in the future. Is there anything you'd like to say to the future generation of historians or teachers about your time in the service or your life in general? Uh, I don't I forgot most of all. Uh, this is more of a legacy statement, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, you know, just, it's like leaving a time capsule for the future. Uh, just talk about your life, you know, uh, your time, what, any message you'd like for someone in the future to see. Uh, I just, uh, I have the, I got nothing to say. Okay. You, all right. She brought something up. <laughs> All right. So, um, how about, um, you know, how does it feel to be a World War II veteran? Uh, you're, you know, how does it feel to be a, sol be a soldier, looking back on your life, your pride, anything like that? Uh, well, I know I, I had a good family. They took care of me and everything like that. So I can't say I have three wonderful daughters, mm -hmm. and, and I live with my one daughter now for the last three years since my wife died, and, uh, and that's it. And, and uh, I can't complain there because everything was good. And she always asks me what I want to eat, and I tell her just put it down in front of me and I'll eat it. <laughs> so that. That's it. All right. Um, and all right. Well, I want to thank you for your service and taking the time to join us. I know you've had a busy day on, on board because uh, we're doing our World War II celebration. Um, but um, so, if there's nothing else, this was An this is Angela Pizzullo, manager of the oral history program. Today is Saturday, August 10th, 2019. Our interview guest was John McDuff from Holland, Pennsylvania. This recording and any ad transcriptions, abstracts, or indexes made from the recordings will be stored in the Oral History Department of the Battleship New Jersey, the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project, 
and the New Jersey State Library System. All recordings will be made available to writers, researchers, teachers, and historians. This is Angelo Pizzullo signing off. Okay. Okay. This is Angelo Pizzullo, manager of the Oral History Program. Uh, we're going to do an addition to the interview. Uh, today is Saturday, August 10th, 2019. We are still talking to Mr. John McDonough. McGuff, excuse me. Um, Mr. McGuff, while you were on Okinawa, the war was over, but you had some other experiences. Could you well, talk about the uh, Japanese soldiers who did not realize the war was over? Well, they were, we right away, <clears throat> right across from our outfit where we were stationed, the compound for the PWs were across the road. I remember one time, uh, a lot of them didn't know the war was over, and they would come down and try to steal food from us or something like that. And so, other times they they would try to shoot somebody or they get shot. But the, I remember one time they're all standing in attention, and I, I had my own jeep. You know, I was I used to go out to different companies and get information so I could let, let, put it on the chart. To let everybody read it. And I saw these guys all standing there. And I asked, <clears throat> I asked the lieutenant, what was the, 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 the they all standing in attention for? He says, one of the soldiers killed another soldier, a Japanese soldier. And he said, what did he, he, what'd he do? He said, he stole clothes off them. Here they were given a lot of, every guy would, would give them like a, a shirt, a pair of pants, and you know, they're, they're helpers when they, you know, they all had their Japanese prisoners. I had the five all the time, but they never asked me for clothes. But they, they said they did. And, the, <clears throat> and one of the Japanese prisoners in the prison compound stole one of the things and the guy, the other soldier, killed him. So they, to find out who did it, they all had to stand at attention. And when I was riding past there in the afternoon, they were still standing there. And they finally, he finally collapsed the, the one and when they, he actually told them what he'd done, and uh, they all were relieved, you know, they all would go back to their beds or everything like that. But he was, he stole clothes. So what they did, you're supposed to only have two pair of pants, two shirts, and, then, and everything like that. Some of them had more clothes than we had. Because they, they told them they put it in a pile and they put a pile. It was high. And the, that was stuff that the guys were actually giving their prisoners that they had working with them to the extra clothes. They had more clothes than we had. <laughs> so uh, and the, I, I don't know what happened to the guy. They, they took him away, and I don't know if he's, he's still serving life or dead now by now. But that was that. That's what the. But the. When it, it took a while for the ones in the cave to, to realize that the war was over, and then they all they all gave out eventually. But the. But that that the clothes, I couldn't believe. It. And they said they got rid of all the clothes and everything like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's it. That's, that's the end of it. All right.